The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. Hello, my name is Hugh Henry. This is Free Thought Forum. We're here with Laurie Dietrich, and we're going to talk about the burning times, the burning of witches. Laurie Dietrich is an elder of the Sibylline Order, an internationally neo-pagan teaching order with roots in several Wiccan traditions. She is the writer and ritualist of a particular interest in the psychology of religion. Laurie, I know the last time you and a friend of yours were here to talk about Wicca, you began by talking about the wonderful mythology <laughs> and then saying, yeah, but that's all bunk. And since I spoke to you about the burning times, well, let me get into a little of this. The burning times was the time when the burning of the witches, and there are stories of all the millions of women who were, who were slain. And this, this, there have been three films, one of which is actually called The Burning Times, three videos. Or is that the name of the whole series? I forget. I am not familiar with those. Oh, I've seen them. And they, they were made to, I think they were Canadian, and they were made to cover this. They're made by Wiccans. And this has a legend of all its own. So, Laurie, what's the legend and what's the <laughs> truth? <laughs> yes, it is. There, there is a great deal of mythology around the burning times. Um, actually, that, that phrase appears for the first time in the writings of Gerald Gardner who I know you know is the founder of Wicca, the neo-pagan modern witchcraft revival religion. Uh, could you give um, a date on that? 1950. Yeah. <laughs> 1950. Although he would, like, he would like us to believe that it, it was much older. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but the burning time seems to be a phrase that he coined to represent the time of the witchcraft, witchcraft persecutions, primarily in Europe, but you know, by extension in America as well and to sort of claim those as pagan martyrs, mm -hmm. as martyrs to his religion. Yes. The feminists on this side of the pond kind of got into it. The legend spread and grew. Uh, uh, the number grew, too. The number, yes. The, <laughs> the number variously has been between 100,000 and 9 million, the, the infamous 9 million women killed in Europe because they were uh, either witches or traditional midwives slash healers who threatened the medical community. Mm -hmm. The actually none of those none of those numbers were ever had never had real scholarly basis. But what we ha what has happened since about the mid nineteen seventies, there's been a real rebirth of good scholarly looks at the information that's out there. Pre nineteen seventy or so Historians were primarily basing what they knew about the witchcraft persecutions on the anti-witchcraft propaganda, mm -hmm. witch hunter manuals, uh, witch anti-witch sermons. The what's the how do you pronounce it? The Malleus Maleficarum. The, I him, the hammer of the witches. The hammer of the witches, which, which is supposed to be the the, the father of all bandits. Yes, which we we in the in the community affectionately call the Malleus. <laughs> and we, we shorten it. Um, and yeah, that's been the very well-known witch hunter's manual. Um, historians for a long time extrapolated from that and thought that that was the norm. It wasn't. Um, this was a, a, a deeply disturbed man, <laughs> couple of men, um, with some real sort of psychosexual issues that that they. Well, the, the, the story put I heard. The story I heard, um, and this might have been from somebody like Dolores Nowicki or somebody. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the story I heard is that uh, out of Rome, a couple of, of gentlemen were concerned about what might be practiced as Christianity up in the hills, since they didn't think they had you know, real priests up there and real education, and they were concerned about some serious drift. So they went up into the hills and, and found these people out there where there weren't any roads and so forth, who very happily showed them their traditions. And these two men came back to Rome about the color of this paper, <laughs> and proceeded to write that book. <laughs> I have not heard that story, but I, it certainly could be true. It could be apocryphal. That's you know, the, strangely enough, for such a new religion, you know, the, the revivalist witchcraft, uh, 
it's it's amazing how many myths have grown up in in just just since 1950. <laughs> But uh, new, new scholarship puts the number of actual witches executed, the, the best estimate now is 30 to 50,000 mm -hmm. over a 400 year time span. There are actually only 15,000 documented cases of witchcraft executions in all of Europe and America that have been found to date. So the, the numbers are, are quite a bit different than the mythology would have us believe. Okay, let me get into some technical stuff here. The church technically didn't burn witches. The church would excommunicate, and then the magistrate would order the burning. I believe that is true. Uh, my research is actually very interesting about the, the difference between the way the church in general handled the witchcraft cases and the secular courts handled the cases. Um, the church saw their mission as saving the soul. Yes. The Inquisition, the Catholic-backed Inquisition, in almost all cases s spared the life of confessing repentant witches. Mm -hmm. It tended to be the, the secular courts, particularly the small community-based courts, mm -hmm. that were just absolute slaughterhouses. That's where you saw 90% of your accused witches or as, burned as, or hung. Or as Monty Python's text would say, <laughs> and then we burn her! <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, witches were burned as automatic heretics. Heretics were considered worse than thieves or murderers because a murderer only took this life, a heretic misguided and took your eternal life. Also, unlike murder, heresy was contagious and could condemn many. And finally, since the church and state were so tightly bound, heresy was automatically treason. This plus the fact that the prince, as a church pr Christian prince, was responsible for the spiritual health of his people was why heretics were burned. I, I am sure that that's... Uh that that's the case. Again, there's, I think there's a real danger, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> I, I, think there's, I think it's terribly dangerous when, when religion and uh, you know, statecraft become intertwined. My own feeling about the, the witchcraft persecutions is that they were not so much a religious phenomenon as a secular social phenomenon fueled by religious authority. Um, you know, if, if you I, I think I, I would call witchcraft sort of the ADD of, of the 1500s. If there was a problem, you know, if, if your crops weren't coming in, if your child was, wouldn't get over the croup, you looked around, you found a witch, you got her to confess, and, and you burned her. Okay. And then you felt, you felt better. And you could do that by, uh, you know, it, it, it's just much easier to kill someone if you can say God told you to do it. Well, then there's the, what I call the cogito ergot sum theory that during this time the weather in Europe was damp and nasty mm -hmm. and the primary crop, they did, the, the peasants could, he couldn't even afford wheat so they lived off of rye and the ergot fungus grows on rye and it is the wonderful source of LSD mm -hmm. but ergot itself not only includes LSD, it includes some stuff that will guarantee the worst bloody trip anybody ever had and the thought is that a lot of people at this time were tripping out on ergot poisoning you had the dancing crazes mm -hmm. where people would, uh, contagious dancing, where people would start dancing, they couldn't stop, and the whole village and whole regions would just start dancing and dropping from it. Very strange stuff. Well, I know that's one of, that's one of the theories that's put forward to explain the Salem witch craze, you know, in this Ergot? country in, in 1692. That yeah. I didn't know. And, well, and, and there, are, there are many theories. Um, I, I got a couple. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think you put a bunch of little repressed Puritan teenage girls in, in, in a room and they'll come up with all kinds of interesting things. But one of the problems, of course, in Salem uh, was that they allowed what was called spectral evidence, mm -hmm. which meant if a young girl, if a teenage girl had a dream, mm -hmm. she could, she could con put that in, in a court of law and the, the jurors would believe the evidence of her dream. You know, but a lot, of, a lot of these things hinged on some really dubious well, judicial practices. We've seen many examples of children's fantasies getting away from you. Mm -hmm. uh, 1980s, the, the sex, the, the, what, the satanic daycare yeah, sex well, the, abuse for, craze here in this another country. Another one was the story behind The Exorcist, mm. the story behind the story. Mm -hmm. It turns out it wasn't a girl, it was a boy. And the problem was he didn't want to go to school. And he kept, had to kept, keep confabulating he and confabulating. He couldn't have a cough. <laughs> you know, and it, it just, it just, you know, you, 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 what a tangled web we weave mm -hmm. when first we practice to deceive. And the kid had to keep going because stopping was kind of hazardous. <laughs> and that happens to children. And a lot of, a lot of 
these courts, both in Europe and America, took the evidence of children. They, they, and of course, this was a time too when when children really weren't seen. There was not really an understanding of childhood development being. Yeah, different a child was considered to be an adult. Yes, absolutely, just a shrunken one. Yeah. Um, another theory is that look, they'd gone through the Crusades. Um, the some had been local, like the Albigensians against the heresies in Spain. They'd gone through the Jews in in, in Spain. Um, they were running out of things to go through. They were, you know, they had the apparatus. They were used to, and then we burn them, and they'd run out. <laughs> So, witches were next. <laughs> yeah, well, there, and there's a long history, you know, an unfortunate human history of, of scapegoating. When things change, when things are uncomfortable, uh, some of the dates in here too. You, the, the witch in in Europe, the witch burnings began to rise slowly in the 14th and 15th centuries, and really reached this sort of crescendo in the hundred years between 1550 and 1650. Mm -hmm. If you look at what's going on around there, 1350 was the end of the Black Death. Yeah. Um, 1500 was the Reformation. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when the pre-Reformation, when the Catholic Church was very firmly in control and they were the moral authority and everyone yeah. knew where they stood, we don't see this so much. We also see it primarily in places like Germany and Switzerland that were had a lot of political unrest. They were sort of loose confederacies with with warring local governments. Places where church and state were weak, where things were changing, where people were afraid. Witches were a good scapegoat. Then there's the economic theory. I'll go into that a little bit. In Salem, trials were, in one famous case, of an accused man who was pressed for confession. They placed boards on him and kept adding heavy stones. In, in this case, the only thing he would say is, more stones, until he died. The reason was that if he died a witch, his inheritance was confiscated by the court. But if he never confessed, it was not affected, and his wife and children would inherit his estate. Uh, more about property. Which trials occurred after gr the great religious wars were mainly over? These wars were fought primarily with mercenary bands. Each band had women who were attached to the group and usually married to one of the troops. Being a mercenary or a woman with them was a better deal than being a peasant and being mm -hmm. the one pillaged, you know, raped and burned. The pay was better and you got to be the impressor instead of the victim. If your soldier husband died, you received his death benefit and usually married another soldier. By the end of the war, some of these men had, women had serious cash and no husband. Now they return to what's left of their village. They've been the oppressors. They must have been loose morals, so they were not really Christian. You have a woman and all this money and no husband. Cash was something peasants rarely saw. Burn her as a witch and get the gold. Yeah, and a, an awful lot of the witches that were burned were widows. Um, With money, I'd bet. Some, some yes, and some no. Kind of, I think it depended on. There, and you know, there's a whole constellation of reasons people do this. Um, a lot of, a lot of them were very marginalized people. A lot of them were very poor, uneducated, sort of outsiders, generally disliked. Um, and that, that's a good example of sort of the scapegoat model. Then there were the folks that were a little higher up the social scale, particularly widowed women with money and no one to protect them, and they were also a good candidate for more economic reasons. Um, didn't you see a lot of that in Salem, that latter one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm going to press you on that first one because I know your, your, your uh, interest is in psychology. We're kind of a long way away and the documentation is kind of thin. Are you sure about you know, the, the number of that going on? Well, the, the new research is interesting because it's what, what people have started to do in the last 25 to 30 years with the help of computers is to comb through the actual trial documents. And those actually have quite a bit to say about the economic status of the people being tried, mm -hmm. because they'll talk about things like fines levied or, um, you know, the possessions of the accused. And the picture that is is starting to form is that a lot of things we already knew, primarily women, overall seventy-five yeah, yeah, to eighty percent women. Um, a lot of a lot of them were were poor, uh, elderly marginalized in the society. Okay. Um, what, they, what they are also saying is that there really is no overwhelming profile of the average witch, mm -hmm. other than, of course, the gender thing. Yeah. Um, so there, there are no hard and fast numbers at this point, but what we are starting to see are better representations of what was really going on because they're now looking at trial records and not just um, 
sort of propaganda pamphlets about the most sensational of the trials. Now, we spoke before the, the show about some lovely Shakespeare stuff, mm -hmm. and I'm going to bring that up right now. You're um, going to say the name, aren't you? Shakespeare, um, you know, there's a problem with that in the play. She's, she's a player, so anyway, Shakespeare had, had two masters. The first one was under Queen Elizabeth. They were the, the Chamberlain's players, mm -hmm. and he hated the guy. In fact, the Falstaff, the big fat fool, is actually that Chamberlain. He parodied him. And so his relationship with Queen Elizabeth wasn't very good. Well, Queen Elizabeth is, a, is succeeded by uh, James Stewart of Scotland. And James and, and, and uh, Shakespeare apparently struck up famously. They really got along. In fact, at that point, uh, the cast became the King's Players. So Shakespeare wrote a play just for James about his earliest ancestors. And since Laurie plays in plays, and there's this huge superstition, <laughs> we must refer to it as the Scottish yes, play. The Scottish play. Now take it from there. <laughs> uh, there is, as you know, as, as we are dancing around a long tradition that you do not say the name of, yep. this, of this show. Mm. Uh, it's considered to be cursed. There are all sorts of theatrical curse breakers that, that you have to do if someone <laughs> slips up and says, you know, we send you outside, you turn around three times and spit and <laughs> have to say a line from Love's Labor's Lost before we let you back in the theater. There are several theories about the origins of this curse. Well, first, the reason why witches were in this play yes. was that, first, that James was deathly afraid of witches. He was deathly concerned that in his court in Scotland, he had been the victim of witchcraft. So my thought is when this, we saw this play, he probably got a, a really, a, a seriously th thrilled, you know, a Halloween level thrill out of it. Yes, I think he had a real sort of fear slash fascination <laughs> yeah, with yeah. witchcraft and witches. Okay, and continue. So, of course, Shakespeare being a good businessman, because he was. Well, he liked the guy. And, and you know, I, I don't know for sure if he liked him or not. I, he may have. Um, you well, know, whether, whether he did or not, I, don't, I, I, think, it's, I think it's wise well, to for, put something in that's interesting to the king, whether you like him or not. Well, for one thing, in a much earlier play, I believe, what, Henry the, the Third or Second, mm -hmm. it's about a, uh, uh, a, 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 a vain king who gets deposed, and it's honestly done. It needs to be done. And this actually got Shakespeare in serious trouble, because Essex saw this play, saw himself as the rescuer, saw Queen Elizabeth as the vain queen, actually <laughs> tried to do something, and it was clearly connected with the plane, and there was an awful lot of, 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 of flop sweat on Shakespeare at that point. <laughs> In uh, the Scottish play, um, the killing of a king is so unnatural mm. that all of nature reacts. There are, there are you know, weird things happening everywhere, it is such a cursed thing to kill a king. Oh yes, and, it, and it, it's, a, it's a beautiful play. So it's the opposite. Yes. And absolutely supportive of, of James and his, and his monarchy. Okay, go ahead. But he, he does, Shakespeare does uh, put witches, the, the famous three witches, the bubble, bubble, toil, and trouble lines. Uh, and oh, the they, best, the be, one of the best stagings I've ever heard about this one was they put the witches with their long skirts on roller skates. <laughs> So all the time they moved, they were they moved really weird. Oh, that's great. That's but a go great ahead. idea. But so they're they're in there, and I think I think most people who know who know Shakespeare and know the Scottish play know that the the witches, the three witches particularly, play quite a quite a role. In, oh, yeah. in what unfolds in the story, um, and one of the theories about the origin of the curse is that in in the canon in Shakespeare. Uh, certain types of situations, certain types of, of rituals, you know, holy rites, are not completed. Mm. Weddings are never completed on stage. Funerals are never completed on stage. They may start and leave the stage or be done off stage. But there was superstition about if you went all the way through the wedding service on stage, you might actually be married to to the the man in a dress standing next to you because, of course, women didn't play. Well, there's a similar uh, thing about the famous Hopi sand paintings in that they always leave a part out. Mm. And uh, when the, one of them, he said, well, couldn't you complete this one? He said, oh my goodness, he laughed. He says, if we did, every woman in Washington, D.C. would become pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so they always but leave they a good piece. But that, that is, that's the, one of the theories about the curse is that in the entire canon, the only ritual that Shakespeare completed on stage is the incantation when, when the witches summon Hecate and she appears. 
and because he messed up and wrote and wrote the whole thing and it is performed entire on stage there the, the play is cursed mm -hmm. that's one of one of the, the the suggestions about where the curse originated I think by now we've all spent 400 years believing it's cursed and it, it is <laughs> At this point, if you say that word, something bad will happen. Just just from the force of, of you know sheer human energy put into that over and, the and, years. And knowing knowing player superstitions, as I reminded you earlier, the worst thing I could possibly say is the tagline, which is the last <laughs> line of the play, last line of any play. The tagline carries a superstition yes. about it. But but, the, but of that play, it's like lightning would strike the, the building. <laughs> it, it just might. You know, when I leave, you can't <laughs> But yeah, that James James was very interested in witches. James is in for in fact, you know, the the King James Bible mm -hmm. is the first one to change the word poisoner to witch, giving us that wonderful line, "Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live," mm -hmm. uh, which you know James didn't actually himself write, but I, I think his his ethos was was in the air around. Well, well that. also there's there's the knowledge that you would like to please the king. Absolutely. Just as Shakespeare knew that by writing this play, he would greatly please the king. Yeah, and the, the translators of, of the Bible knew that a, a witch was something that the king would really like to see, <laughs> <laughs> would like to see not live, I suppose. Um, I'd like to pull off in a slightly different direction. There is a book, Witchcraft in the American Southwest, which is really about the Upper Rio Grande. In it, they speak of the work of the Inquisition out of Mexico City. Given an accusation of witchcraft, they would always come promptly and seriously investigate they would always find it to be a case of envy or hatred or a scold. They would admonish the accuser and go home. When the Anglo authority took over, their courts dismissed witchcraft as a superstition not worthy of the court's attention. The peasants would take matters into their own hands, kill someone, and be surprised to be called before the court <laughs> for murder. But I think this, this record of the, and the, the record is still in Mexico City of the, of, this, of the Mexican Christian Inquisition, and they were extraordinarily careful. And they never found a witch. Even though they knew what they were always going to find, they always followed the directions from the beginning, worked it all the way through until they, they got the conclusion that they always wound up getting. <laughs> well, yeah, the Spanish Inquisition did something similar. In 1609, the, the Spanish Inquisition issued the Edict of Silence, which basically said that, you know, there were no witches and nobody was bewitched, and so people started talking about it. So <laughs> we're just going to stop talking about it. And, and they maintained for, for the rest, well, for the next 50 years, while the rest of Europe was still madly burning witches, in Spain, the Spanish Inquisition said, we are the only ones with the right to investigate or burn witches because that is our job, is to yep. investigate and, and, and punish heretics. Yep. And we refused to speak about it. So there were no witch burnings <laughs> in, in Spain from that point on. Uh, very practical people, yeah. in, a, in a way. Yeah. You know? And they, they were actually, they, they were actually able to really bring down the numbers of the witch burnings because one of the folks who had the ear of the ruling council of the Spanish Inquisition pointed out that, you know, this there this wasn't happening until everybody started talking about it. I'm trying to think. There's several things like that that have happened in history. Uh, there may have been some recently, but well, of course, the uh, one of them would be the satanic satanic rites with the children. Yes, thing. absolutely, very similar. And you know, well, Arthur Miller, of course, makes makes the connection in the Crucible between the the communists, you know, the McCarthy yeah. communists. Uh, I think we we did something sort of similar in this country right after 9/11, when anyone who who looked like they might be from one of those countries yeah. was was demonized and attacked. Yeah. Now, this is unfortunately the the concept of the burning times doesn't ever really leave us. I mean, it's it's nice to. I think people people like to look at the concept at, of the witch hunt. Exactly, we are we are still in those times. We are still, you know, as as human beings, we still have an impulse to point fingers and and to scapegoat. And what and religion is a handy way to do that because, of course, it supposedly has the mandate from God. Well, there's a a, a coincidental observation about American history that every twenty years we lose a president in office, and every thirty years we have a witch hunt. Hmm. And uh, the thought is that the, the one in the 80s may have been taken care of by, by the, the Watergate. And uh, so I guess we're due for one we're in due the, for another one. Due sometime in the beginning of the, uh, at the end of this decade. <laughs> well, you know, with the, the ramping up of the religious rhetoric in, in our political sphere right now, I wouldn't be surprised. 
Good I, I, I think it's... Good heavens. heavens. It might be us. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> yeah, we had our turn. That's what the no, no, burning I'm, times was. No, I'm talking about atheists. That's it what might I mean. be us. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> saying, you know, me, me in the witch corner over here. We, we, we know, had was, ours. I, which I, we actually didn't. That's one, one of the real fallacies of the burning times, of course, is that these were witches who were executed. Yeah. They weren't. <laughs> They, you know, they did. They did not believe they were witches. They did not die for some sort of religion. They were, they were tortured, and they confessed, and they were killed, and they all. I, well, I certainly can't say all. Most of them, most likely, went to their deaths believing that they were good Christians. So it's really kind of rotten of us in the neo-pagan community, I think, to try to claim their martyrdom for our cause, when, when really they're, they're. They weren't us. <laughs> no, no, they really weren't. They, they would probably feel martyred twice. You know? <laughs> not only did they die professing that, that they were, they were not what they said they were. You know, now, now we turn around and, and give them that name again. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I was in, in the military in the early 1960s, knowing about this history of, of witch hunts, I was actually concerned. Uh, that uh, proselytizing Christians might wind up in that category, because in the military they, you know, try knocking on doors in the barracks, and people absolutely did not appreciate it. Mm. And around that time, the, the proselytizing Christians and so forth, you know, things were things were not getting ugly, but they were the stage before that. So it was looking like maybe they're they're the ones that are going to be the targets. Well, that didn't happen. Well, I thought we were going to make it through. Be able to go through the bur all the way through the burning times and not even get to the persecution of women, but I guess <laughs> I guess you need to bring your other material on board now, Laurie. <laughs> well, I and again, this is you know I, I have an interest in this. I am certainly not a scholar mm -hmm. on this topic. My my thought is that women, I, the same way that that sort of neo pagan witches have tried to claim the burning times. You know, those people died as martyred, as witchcraft martyrs. Yeah. I think women have tried to do the same thing and tried to claim these women as, as sort of gender feminist, martyrs, feminist, feminist martyrs. martyrs. Um, and, and certainly the numbers are a little bit more supportive of that thesis. But. Yeah, they were all women, the women that were killed after all. 75 to 80 percent overall. Yeah. yeah. It depends on where you were. Iceland, for example, 90 percent of their executed witches were men. Wow. So, you know. Iceland, very different. Um, some Scandinavian countries, about half and half. But overall, most of the witch burnings well, the were Central Euro Europe, and most of them were women. The Scandinavians are usually pretty even-handed, even when they go by that, witches. That's true. <laughs> that's very, very balanced yeah, people. Very balanced and fair. <laughs> but um, my, my suspicion is that the reason that this came down so hard against women, I'm, I'm just a real big believer in the scapegoat theory. Mm -hmm. Women were easier. They, they, they had lower social status, and we can talk all we want about how justified that may or may not have been. Well, there is the rule of thumb, of course. But the reality is they were of lower th social there status. There is the rule of thumb, of course. Which is? Well, you didn't know that. The rule of thumb comes from the, the, the rule that if you're going to beat your wife, the switch you use should be no bigger than the diameter of your thumb. Oh, well, that's good. That kind. is the rule of thumb. That's very nice of them. I'm, I'm More I'm than glad. that, it's cruel. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad someone no, was that looking is out the for official, them. That's the official rule of thumb. <laughs> And you know, we and certainly, you know, in, in this day and age, we're a little bit more enlightened, and I think we all deplore that that sort of. I hope we are. I hope so. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, the one I'm married to is. But um, at the time, the reality was these were people of lower social status, and if you were looking for someone to scapegoat and accuse, you went after women. Women were easier. Women didn't have particularly particularly women that didn't that were unmarried or didn't have someone to protect them and stand up for them. One of the things that they have, they have well, shown... Well, I'll have to interrupt you oh, here, yes. because we've actually reached the end of the time for the Burning time. Times. <laughs> and this has been Hugh Henry and Laurie Dietrich talking about the Burning Times of Witches. And thank you very much for Three Thought Forum. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to Duke or Dictator. No person 